Ephesians 6 1. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Do the Psalm 36 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Psalm 36 31. Matthew 5 16. Let your light shine me for men and said to me that they might see that they might may see your good works and praise your Father in heaven. Matthew 5 16. Let your light shine before men and such a way that they may see your good works and praise your Father in heaven. Galatians 2 verse 16. A man is not fed by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. As Reginald did, so now I'll be reading Proverbs 18 and 10. The Lord is a mighty tower where his people can run for safety. Hi, Revolution. Hi, guys. Caden Head's here. We sure miss you guys. We miss everybody. There's been babies born, Charity, and uh, we miss the Hans and all of our other new members that I don't remember their names uh, just yet. <laughs> but we hope everybody is being safe. So we can get together again soon. And uh, just uh, be sure that uh, you just keep your eyes on Jesus and not on the media and all the hype and all the uh, other things that are being said and done. And trust that uh, we'll be back together with you soon. Love you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Well, hey, good morning, Revolution Church. It's good to see these videos. That was really cool. And to say hi to some people we haven't seen in a while. Uh, we want to welcome you to the service this morning. And uh, also let you know that at the end of the service, we're going to have a question and answer session. So you can text in the question, or you can even text call me, and I'll call you and let you ask your question live. You can do it either way. Um, and if this is your first time, we're so glad that you're here. We have a, a gift for you at the guest table. We want to give you a free T-shirt for being our guest here this morning. And uh, if you just fill out one of those Connect cards, we'll hook you up with a T-shirt, okay? So right now what we're going to do is we're going to pray, and we're going to invite the Lord Jesus Christ to join us here this morning and that he would be the center of everything that's happening. So our whole purpose is to glorify him this morning. Amen? Amen. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask someone there in your living room, if you're watching from home, to lead in prayer. And we're going to pray silently here in the, the, the sports complex. And then I'll say a short prayer for us, and then we'll worship the Lord uh, in song. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, we want to just praise your name this morning because you are a glorious God. You are a loving God. You demonstrated your love for us by sending your only son to die on that cross for us. Lord, there's nothing we can be more thankful for than that. We're thankful for the salvation to be in Christ and for what that means, for not just for here and now, but for all of eternity. So Lord, your name is worthy to be praised. And so we lift up Jesus this morning and pray that God would draw all men unto him we do this in his wonderful name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Good morning, Revolution. Can I get everybody to stand up and kind of get involved and do a little clapping going? I need a little bit more than that. There we go.
strengthen you in your inner selves from the riches of his glory through the spirit. I ask that Christ will live in your hearts through faith. 
As a result of having strong roots in love, I ask that you'll have power to grasp love's width and length, height and depth, together with all believers. I ask that you'll know the love of Christ that is beyond knowledge, so that you will be filled entirely with the fullness of God. And we are going to sing, You Are Good Again. You are good, good, oh, you are good, good.
Lord, we just thank you this morning <laughs> in a crazy time filled with change. And Father, in the midst of all of this turmoil, Father, in the midst of all of our mistakes and our imperfections, you are solid, Father. You are the only thing that we can rely on. You are our Heavenly Father, Lord, and you are absolutely perfect. And we thank you and we praise you this morning for everything that you have done in our lives and everything that you are doing right now in our lives and in this place We invite you in, Father, through your word and and through the preaching today. Please open our hearts and minds and help us to hear only your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. There we go. No, I'm not now. All right. There we go. All right. So good morning. Glad you're here. Show me your wristband. What do you have? Okay, cool. Good deal. Well, we're, we're hoping that system kind of works. Just look out for the wristbands. These are not the ones that we actually ordered. Amazon said they'll deliver on the 28th. You know how that went. Okay. I don't know what happened. It's probably somebody else's house three doors down, but uh, we'll make that work. Thanks for the st- music stand here. All right. So this morning we're in Colossians chapter 2. So either open your device or your Bible there if you would. And Samantha Marillo is going to come up and she's going to read for us. And she's going to use this mic right here. And you can follow along if you would. There you go. Colossians 2, um, 9. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all for our trespasses. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by Triffing over them in him. Amen. Thank you very much, man. Give her a hand. Good deal. <clears throat> All right. So the major theme of the book of Colossians is Christ alone. We just sang that earlier. And that phrase means so much because when it comes to your salvation, you know what you need? Christ alone. When you think you've lost everything, your marriage falls apart, you lose your job, you're in the middle of a pandemic, and you think I have nothing, you know what you need? Christ alone. He really is the answer for every problem you have. And the reason this world is falling apart at the seams, literally, as you watch the news, is because they have thrown away Christ and they think they want happiness and joy and satisfaction in something or someone else. But God's people, what do we need? Tell me. 
Christ alone. Amen. So this young Colossian church, Paul's writing a letter to these people he's never met. He's in prison. He led this guy, Epaphras, to the Lord, who went back to this small town, and he led a bunch of his friends to the Lord, and they formed a church. And they were going really well, but then all of a sudden, two different bad influences came into that church. It, bad influence number one was Jewish legalists. These are Jews who had grown up under the Old Testament, obviously, and had all the rituals, all the holidays, all circumcision, all the what you could and could not eat, what you could and could not do, and all the things that Jesus had fulfilled, they were trying to say, yeah, Jesus is good, but you need Jesus plus the law. And let me tell you something, Jesus plus something equals nothing. Salvation is by grace through faith alone, in Christ alone. But the Jewish legalists would try to say, well, yes, you need Jesus, but you also need all these rules. Now, don't confuse living a Christian life with good standards with a bunch of rules. The two are very different. When you find yourself in a religious situation, you know, in, uh, statistically speaking, three years from now, half of you will be living in another city and you'll have to find another church. Be really careful of a church that wants to play the Holy Spirit and wants to tell you what you can and cannot do and has a whole bunch of rules and regulations. That's what these Jewish legalists were trying to do. The second bad influence on the church was Greek philosophers. They're like, yes, Jesus is great. There's a good philosophy in Jesus, but look at all these other philosophies, Aristotle and Plato and all these other things. You need them as well. And Jesus was just another nice addition to the religion, but not all that they needed. What we learned last week um, was that you had these influences in the church. And here's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10. Give no offense to Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Now, this is really powerful. Basically, it comes down to there's three types of people in the world. There are Jews, there are Greeks, and then there are, there's the church of God. There's those who hold to the God of the Bible. There's those who don't and other gods or other philosophies. But then there's the church. And what you had in this church was what you have today. The Greek philosophers were basically the liberals of the day. And the Jewish legalists were the conservatives of the day. But what Paul called them to do is the same thing Paul calls us to do. Don't be left. Don't be right. Be above. We are called to be above all this, not to get caught up in the fray of all these things. Because neither side has it completely right. And this is so appropriate here in the year of an election. You've got left versus right, Democrat versus Republican, Trump versus Biden. And if you're not careful, you will get sucked into all that mess. And what God calls you to do is to rise above it all. doesn't mean you don't vote. doesn't mean you don't get politically active. It just means your hope is not in one party or the other. There was a book that was written years ago by Larry Hurtado called The Destroyer of Gods. And he did this amazing research. I strongly recommend the book about how does a world governed by the Roman Empire who has Greek philosophy for its education and Jews who come out of the Old Testament, how do they turn the world upside down and everybody becoming Christians to the point where Christianity spreads like wildfire without the internet, without mail, without transportation, all over the then known world? How did that happen? And he, he explains that there was five things about the, the early church that just made it contagious to where people are like, man, this is so different. We want some of this. The first thing was racial equality. You think we have racism today. It is nothing compared to what they had in biblical days. Okay? You know, remember the story of the Good Samaritan? There was a guy who fell, who was beaten amongst, by thieves and left for dead. And people would rather walk on the other side of the road than to help the guy. And it was because of racism. But yet in the church, you had all different colors sitting next to each other in church. You had masters and former slaves sitting next to each other in church. You had temple prostitutes and Jewish housewives sitting next to each other in church. And people walked down like, man, you don't see this anywhere in the world. What is going on here that there's all this racial equality? There was no classism, no ageism, no sexism. It was all one in Christ. They had done something completely different. The second thing they saw was social justice. Back in that, in fact, Plato, which was one of the Greek philosophers, he said that you see some people and you just know they were born to be a slave. That's Plato. And that's the way people thought back then, is they, they swallowed this whole idea that if you looked a certain way, you were meant to be poor, you were meant to be a slave, you were meant to be whatever. 
And you think that's way back then? You travel to India today, they still have, even though it's illegal, illegal, they still have the caste system. They still have the bottom of the rung is the Dalits. They are the untouchables. You don't even go near those people. You don't give them a job. You don't even feed them because they're, they're, they are paying for their bad karma. You can let a cow walk the streets, but you can't feed a starving five-year-old girl in the streets because somehow she's untouchable. So this kind of thing is what they, the church embraced. And you know what? No, we're here to help the poor. We're here to treat uh, people with leprosy. We're here to help those who have been outcasts. We're here to help everybody. The first hospitals were started by Christians. The first orphanages were started by Christians. The whole idea of social justice was a Christian cause. The next thing they were known for was civility or forgiveness. That you may come and burn down my house, but Jesus taught me to turn the other cheek, and I'm not going to do the same to you. Prior to that, it was anything goes. You know, you, you, uh, uh, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, you, you smite me one cheek, I'm going to punch you back. It's all those things. And Christianity said, no, you know what? We're not going to react to you. We're going to be civil. We're going to love you. We're going to be kind. We're even going to go one step farther. We're going to forgive you. And the world had never seen anything like that. The fourth thing we saw was the sanctity of life. In biblical times, if you had too many kids you, and you had another baby, you could abort it. You could even take it if you weren't able to get the abortion the way the Egyptians and the Romans did it. You could just want the baby born and just throw it in the river. It was no big deal. It was very common. That's why Herod could kill all, everybody, all the babies under two. And it was like no big deal. This is what happens. This is what happened in the world. There was no respect for life, especially of the unborn or the very young, and especially not for the elderly. If a plague of leprosy broke out in a certain town, everybody fled. The Christians stayed, even at the risk of their own life, because they believed that all life was sacred, that every human being, regardless of intelligence or finances or education or skin color, every human being was created in the image of God, and therefore they were holy. And then the fifth thing we saw was they were sexually pure. They lived in a day where it was very common for a man not only to have a wife, but to have several mistresses, and most of the religions of those days involved sexual perversion as part of worship. Crazy, right? And yet the world came in and said, you know what? No. Sex is for one man, for one woman, for one lifetime, and that's it. That's holy. And let me tell you, that even though this is the 21st century, that principle still applies today to God's people. And yet we live in a world that's totally uh, messed up. A recent Gallup poll said that 68% of Christians see no moral problem with sex outside of marriage or homosexuality, but 72% of Christians said it was immoral to wear fur. What Bible are you reading that homosexuality is okay, but wearing fur is immoral? That's, that fulfills what Jesus said, that broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many people go down the that, that find it. And Jesus said, many that day on the, in Matthew chapter 7 will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and cast out demons and do all these many miracles? And he will say to them, depart from me, I never knew you. The world is full of people who claim Christ, but don't claim the Bible of Jesus Christ. And there's a, there's a major difference. Now here's what you see. Now help me here. Look at the first, look at these five issues. Look at the first one. If you were to say liberal or conservative, which which end tends to identify with racial equality more? Liberal, right? Okay, in general, liberal. That's true. And then if we go to the second issue, social justice, who tends to identify with that as a cause? Yeah, I would say liberal, okay? We're going to skip the third one for a reason here. Um, if you were to talk about the sanctity of life, being pro-life, who tends to be that way? Conservative. Who tends to preach sexual purity? Conservative. But you know who practices... Uh, Civility? Neither. Neither of them do. Um, you, look on, you, you, I, you look on Facebook, and I don't recommend you to spend much time there at all, really. <laughs> it gets depressing. Um, but you will see people arguing back and forth, you know, versus pro-life, pro-choice, you know, gay rights, whatever, and all, traditional marriage. But you'll see neither side being civil. Cussing each other, calling each other names, just... And whether it's the Democrats or Republicans, they tweet all kinds of hateful, evil stuff on both sides, and that is not what Christianity is called to do. You see, you know what Christianity does? It claims all five of these. 
If you rise above, you don't get caught in the right, you don't get caught in the left, you are balanced, but more than balanced, you're above. I'm not, I'm not, don't confuse it with being moderate. We're not talking about being moderate. That means people who don't have a spine, okay? You can't make up your mind. Christians rise above. And what we do is we embrace racial, racial equality and social justice, but don't call me a liberal. We embrace the sanctity of life, we're pro-life, and we're pro-traditional marriage, but no, don't call me a conservative. I'm a Christian. And, I, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to be civil on all these issues, and we can agree to disagree. That's what you see absent in the world today, and that's what Christ calls us to. And last week we learned that when you realize that Christ is sufficient for all your needs, then you will submit to him in all your choices. Now think about that for a second. Is there an area of your life, are you like me, that there's an area of your life where you're like, man, I keep struggling whether to obey here or not. And this is the area of my life. Here's what's going on here. In that area of your life, whether it be your sexuality, your finances, your anger, your vocabulary, if you're struggling in that area of your life, you know what? You don't think Jesus is sufficient to meet your needs in that area of life. Jesus is good for anything else, but over here, I've got to have my fix. I've got to have my little secret addiction. I've got to have whatever it is. Because Jesus can't meet this need. Yes, he can. Yes, he can. What, it, what needs to happen is you need to grow in that area and start studying scriptures that apply to that area and absorb those biblical principles and let the truth of God replace the lies that you've been believing. Now, usually on a Sunday, when I'm teaching verse by verse through a book of the Bible, we happen to be in Colossians, I'll cover anywhere from five to eight verses. Today, I'm not going to cover eight verses. I'm not going to cover five. I'm not even going to cover two. I'm not even going to cover one. I'm going to cover two words. Just two words today. In Him. And the reason I'm going to do that is because you will find to the Apostle Paul, the phrase, in Christ, in Him, in Jesus, is the biggest theme of all that he writes about. So I think it's something that demands our time and our attention. Just in this passage alone, look at the highlighted areas there. In Christ, in Him, in Him, in Him, in Him, with Him, with Him, with Him, in Him. Do you see a pattern there? I think this is really important that we cover this thoroughly. So, how were believers referred to in the New Testament? You know, we call ourselves born again, we call ourselves Christian, but let's see what the Bible says. Two, only two times in the New Testament are believers called Christians. Three times we're called born again. Seven times we're called converts or the converted people. Forty times we're called saved. And these all mean the same thing. This is probably different uh, categories of people. 61 times we're called saints. So you don't have to perform a certain number of miracles and live for certain centuries and die to become a Satan. Saint. Saint. Sorry, Satan. Not saint. Raise your hand this morning if you're a saint. Not a Satan, it's a saint. Okay, good, good. If you know Jesus Christ, your Savior, you are a saint. But watch this. Over 70 times, it calls you those that are in Him, in Christ, in the Messiah, or in Jesus, or one of those synonymous phrases there. So let's look at this idea of being in Him. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are in Him. 1 Thessalonians 4.14 says, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and I have that highlighted in yellow and underlined because that's what it means to be a Christian. Someone who puts their full faith and trust in the fact that Jesus Christ died for your sins. He took all those sins and he buried them forever. And then he rose again so that you can live forever with him. If you believe that, if you're, that's your only hope, then you are born again. You are, you are in Christ. It says, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with, this, with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead, what? in Christ, will rise first. Everybody, now think of someone you know and someone you love that's passed away. Uh, this year we can think of a lot, can't we? Um, we've lost a lot of, we've lost some really uh, dear people to us this year. This year has been very tragic for Revolution Church. But we know and we believe that because they are in Christ, we will see them again. And this event here, which is called the rapture, when Jesus Christ comes and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then it goes on to say, we which were alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air. When I was uh, at Bible College up in Springfield, Missouri, I had a job working at a cemetery. It was just two of us, 
and uh, we, we were supposed to mow the grass and weed eat. I hate weed eating. Tammy loves it. That's why our marriage is so great. This other guy, he loved the weed eating. I liked mowing. So I mowed around all the tombstones and he weed eated. We just walked, worked all day long on this like nine acre cemetery. I would tell people I had a great job. I was over a lot of people. And so often I would, um, I would be, some of you are just not getting that. Uh, explain that to somebody. Anyway, I, I would often be just, you know, um, mowing and thinking about, you know, what if the Lord came while I'm mowing this cemetery? The dead in Christ rise first. All these tombs opening up, people going, hey, how are you? And then we're caught up together with the Lord. You know, I used to think, wow, how cool it would be if the rapture happened while mowing in the cemetery. But that's a true event that is coming. And uh, Ephesians chapter 2 talks about how we are in Christ. It says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near. How? By the blood of Christ. You... When you're lost and you don't know Christ as all of us used to be, right? Okay? And we're no better than anybody else. We just happened to find the gospel and Jesus found us and saved us, okay? But before you were saved, you were far away from God. You weren't making like little baby steps towards God. You were running the opposite direction. But he came and he chased you down and he saved your soul. And now that you're in, you're brought near by the blood of Christ. Because Jesus died for you. You're not brought near by your baptism. You're not brought near because you keep the Ten Commandments. You're not near because of any of those things. You're near because Christ died in your place. That should have been me on that cross. That should have been you on that same cross. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15 talks about this phrase, being in Christ. For as in Adam, do you realize that when you're lost, you are considered in Adam? So when Adam fell by disobedience, by eating of the forbidden fruit with Eve. All of us are in Him. It's what's called in theological circles our federal head. We are not only sinners by choice, we're sinners by nature, and we're sinners by inheritance. We inherited a sin nature from Adam and Eve, and everybody who's in Adam, we all die. So also, those who are in Christ shall be made alive. So, let me list for you several benefits of being in Christ, these two important words. First of all, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And I want you to read the blue with me, okay? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is what? A new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And this, the, the Greek language here is what's called the present imperative. It's a truth that is now true but continues to be true. It's not a one-time thing that's done. You, when you are born again, you are in Christ, all things become new. But guess what? You're always in the process of things becoming new. You know, how many of you maybe, you don't have to raise your hands, but when you got saved, like you're into it, man, I thought I'd be a better person by now. <laughs> I've been saved since I was nine. You can see how old I am. I'm still struggling, but I see progress. I see old things continually passing away. Things I thought should have been gone 10 years ago, 20 years ago, but they're going away. They're fading. Let me just say this as a word of warning or caution to you because I love you. If you've been saved, but there's no change in your life, like zero, zip, none, you might want to look back at that decision and see if it was for real. You might be like many others who went forward, prayed a pair, filled out a card, shook the pastor's hand and said, okay, I'm going to heaven. But nothing changed on the inside. There was no really commitment because here's what's happening in the gospel that's being preached here today in America. It's who wants to go to heaven? Me, me, me. Who, the, who wants to go to hell? No, no, no. Pray this prayer. Great, you're going to heaven. And there's nothing about the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, if you will confess him as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him dead, you will be saved. But what we all tend to preach is the second half. You just want to be saved? Who wants a free ticket to heaven? And we pray that prayer, and then we wonder why we're 28 years old, and we're just as bad, if not worse, than when we were 12 years old and prayed the prayer. Okay? You've got to submit to Jesus Christ as King of your life and accept Him as Lord and, and Savior both at the same time. This is one of your favorite animals, right? This goes with, really well with eggs on Saturday morning, right? Okay? Pigs love mud. Pigs now they love to be filthy. They like to eat filthy. They, that's why in the Bible they were called unclean. They will eat anything. If there's a dead rat in the corn, man, that's dessert. They will eat anything. They are filthy, nasty characters. They love any 
totally opposite of all of us, right? Okay, that, this is what they want. This is what they want to be. But you can take this same pig and clean it up and put it on a, a leash and take it to the county fair and win a blue ribbon. But guess what? As soon as you get back to the farm and take that off the leash, where's that pig going? Right back. Because you've cleaned up his outside, but you've not changed his heart. On his inward desires are still to be filthy, inside and out. What you need, what religion will teach you is clean up the outside and God will love you. The gospel is God loves you. Now let's change the inside. You see, if any man is in Christ, he is what? A new creation, a new creature. Old things, the old nature, the old pig is gone. And the Bible calls us sheep, which the only advantage of being over sheep and pig is your IQ hasn't gone up much at all. Sheep are very stupid. But sheep don't want to be filthy. Now, will a, will a, will a sheep fall in the mud occasionally? Of course. Will a, will a sheep you know, rub up against something that's dirty? Sure. Sheep aren't perfect. But their nature is different. They desire to keep their wool white. You see, religion is you trying to clean up your right life in order to please God. But Christianity is you. Let me go to the next slide here. Um, so therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old has passed away. Watch this here. Religion is you trying to clean up your life in order to please God. But to be in Christ is to be transformed on the inside and thus be perfect in God's eyes. So you know one of, the, one of the worst lies that we as Christians believe is, you know, you're living for God, you're, you're saved, you know, you're doing right, and all of a sudden you mess up, and now all of a sudden God loves you less. Not true. He loves you more than ever before. Think, those of you who are parents who have multiple kids, you know what? The odds are your worst kid is probably the one you love the most. He's getting more, she's getting more attention than any other because you want so badly to bring them home. You don't love them less. You may even actively love them more because of their behavior. And your Heavenly Father loves you no less. That's not to condone sin. I'm not saying now you have a free pass. What I'm saying is, if you will realize how much He loves you, it'll be the deterrent for your sin. Think about this. David committed his big sin with Bathsheba and even murdered her, his, her husband. Pretty bad, right? Worse than probably anybody in this room has done, most of you except for Art. But almost everybody hasn't done what, what they have done, okay? But David, when he prayed his prayer of repentance, he said, restore unto me what? What did he say restore? Restore to me the joy of my salvation. Now, guess what? He didn't lose his joy because of the sin. He sinned because he lost his joy. You see that? You see... Whenever you fall into sin, you know what's happened? Is you started finding your joy, you trying to look for your joy in something else. Because you had lost it in Christ. Man, explore and enjoy and saturate yourself in the joy of the Lord and how much He loves you. And that will be the best deterrent to sin that you have ever could have. So, you also have purpose in Christ. Purpose in Christ. Ephesians 2 says, we are, we are His workmanship. Could also be translated masterpiece. Look at the person next to you and say, you're a masterpiece. Yeah, amen. I know that was hard to say for some of you, but it's true, okay? It's true. You are created how? In Christ Jesus. And why are you created in Christ Jesus? For good works. Now, religion says, do good works and you'll be in Christ Jesus. No, the Bible says if you're in Christ Jesus, you should do good works. And these are good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in Him. Before you were born, before you were a twinkle in your father's eye, God had a plan of good works for your life. He saw before the foundations of earth that He wanted to elect you and to save you and to make you born again so that you could do good works. Let me, let me ask you a question. How are you living out that purpose? What are the good works that you're involved in? Again, not to be saved, but because you are saved. Again, a further evidence that you're truly saved is you want to fulfill the purpose that God has called you to. Here's one of my favorites. There's no condemnation in Christ. No condemnation in Christ. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, let's invert this verse, which means that if you're not in Christ, guess what? You're living under condemnation. Read John chapter 3. Jesus says, He that believeth is not condemned, but those who believe not are condemned already. 
You're not waiting for the judgment day to be condemned. You're living under condemnation. You're just waiting for your sentence to be carried out. Um, so, Satan says to you all the time, remember when you said that cuss word? Remember that Friday night when you were out where you shouldn't have been? Remember what you watched on that website? Remember what you said to that person? He's constantly saying to you, remember when, remember when. And he's trying to bring up your old sins to make you feel disqualified to serve God. But you know what you need to do? You need to say to Satan, you remember when you were in heaven, but God cast you out? <laughs> you remember when you were in the garden and you tempted Adam and Eve and they fell, but God sacrificed the lamb to cover them and to clothe them? And then you remember when Jesus died on the cross and crushed your little head? Remember when Jesus rose from the dead when you thought he wouldn't? And remember what the scripture says, that, you know, that the Lord rebuke you? You need to remind Satan that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That if you can live guilt-free and know that your sins are covered, you will have the freedom and the liberty to serve God the way that you want to. <clears throat> because there's freedom in Christ. The very next verse in Romans 8, 2 says, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you, what? Free. Free where? In Christ Jesus. If you don't know Christ, you're a slave to sin. You've got shackles on your feet. You're in bondage to sin. But Jesus Christ came and crushed those chains and set you free. The next thing we see is there's unity in Christ. As we wrap this up here, unity in Christ. Galatians 3 says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. It doesn't matter about your ethnicity. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are what? Are all one. And where? Where are we all one? In Christ Jesus. Outside, we're not all one. People do judge you by your education out there. People do judge you by your skin color out there. People do judge you by your class and, your, and all different things. And what kind of house you live in, what kind of car you drive. But in Christ, there's no, there's no classism. There's, we're all one. You see, when we put our ethnicity or our social status or our gender or our sexual identity or anything else before being in Christ, there's division. You see what's happening in the news? Everybody's saying, well, I I'm white, I'm black, I'm this, I'm trans, I'm whatever. And everybody's about their own identity. But when you say, I'm in Christ, then all those other labels disappear. And all those other labels don't matter at all. You see, but when we put our identity in Christ first, there is unity. You see, just look around here this morning, okay? We've got... Cambodian, Chinese, black, white, Hispanic, and art. We've got everything in this room. I'm, I'm picking on this morning in this one. Anyway, we, we've got everything, okay? And you know what? What's happening here this morning, besides churches, is not happening out in the world very much, okay? A lot of people give lip service to it, but in reality, they're still judging based on all those other things. And everybody's fighting for their piece of the pie, when really, if we will all submit to the kingship and the lordship of Jesus Christ, all those labels will go away. There are spiritual blessings in Christ. <clears throat> Ephesians 1 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Every means every. And these, these blessings are in heavenly places. And I won't go through it now, but this Ephesians 1 talks about all, he lists all seven of the spiritual blessings. Look at that. You have election in Christ. Jesus chose you. Remember, remember fifth grade when you would line up to play kickball? Anybody besides me been picked last? Man, that stinks. I hate that. Who wants to be picked last? I mean, the girl on crutches got picked before me. I mean, I was like bottom of the barrel, you know? But when you get picked first, you're like, wow. Makes you feel special, doesn't it? And, and God chose you. He adopted you. He made you his child. He accepts you. He redeems you. He forgives you. He gives you wisdom. He gives you assurance. The assurance of your salvation. All those things are sealed into the day of redemption. All those things are in Christ. And then finally, eternally secure in Christ. It says in Jude 1, To them that are beloved in God, the Father and preserved in Christ. Watch this. You're in God. You're in Christ. Christ is in the Father's hands. I think you're in a pretty safe place. It says we are preserved. You weren't good enough to get saved. And you can't be good enough to stay saved. How many of you use mason jars to preserve stuff? Your grandmas did, right? Your grandmas did preserves, right? 
Those things could last through a nuclear war. I mean, they're preserved. They're in there. They're sealed tight and all that stuff. That's the way your salvation is. It's in Christ. It is preserved. 2 Timothy 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life. Watch this. The promise of eternal life, where is it? In your ability? In your good works? No, the promise is kept in Jesus Christ. He will keep his promise. You don't have to worry about keeping your promise. He'll keep it. So this is what used to be known as NORAD. Okay, It's the North American Defense Center. This is where us older people, we know more about this because just like you grew up with doing fire drills, we grew up with you know, air raid uh, or nuclear war fire drills where we went out to the hallway and you put your hands behind your neck as if that was going to stop the radiation or something. Anyway, you, but you, we really thought, we grew up thinking the Russians are going to bomb us any, any day now. So this, um, this place was built up in Colorado and it, this complex was built 2,000 feet of, under 2,000 feet of granite. There's 15 three-story buildings underneath the ground, and they're protected from movement. In other words, an earthquake or an explosion from a nuclear bomb. And what does this is a system of a thousand giant springs uh, uh, that buildings that sit on and flexible pipe connections to limit the operational effect of movement. They are designed to prevent any of the buildings from shifting more than an inch. That's how, that's how safe this place is. The complex is able to sustain an, an EMP, an ele electromagnetic pulse, and the bunker is built to deflect a 30 megaton nuclear explosion as close within 1.2 miles. Now you may look at that and say, and that's probably the safest place on the planet. If we were to be under attack, this is where Air Force One would fly and the president would go up deep underground and all of our generals would be under, and while we're all melting from radiation, they would be safe underground. <clears throat> but you know what? There's a safer place than NORAD in this Cheyenne complex. And that is in Christ. Let me ask you this morning, do you know him? Are you in Christ? Have you trusted him to be your Lord and Savior? Verse 13 of Colossians says, And you who were dead in your trespasses, God made alive together with him. Okay? Having forgiven us how many of your trespasses? All. I want you to think for just a moment. What's the big sin of your past that really bugs you every time you think about it? What's the big failure? Maybe it's a divorce. Maybe it's unfaithfulness. Maybe it's something you stole and nobody knows that you did it. Whatever it may be. What's the big failure? Let me tell you something. If you're in Christ, He has forgiven all your trespasses. And all means all. He goes on to say, by, how did He do this? By canceling the record of debt. You see, when we sin... We are indebted to God, and we are indebted to God an amount that's beyond what we're able to pay. But look at this. Jesus paid that debt and that stood against us with its legal demands. And this, he took that debt. You know, imagine getting a bill in the mail, and it's an amount that you can't pay. Jesus takes it, and what does he do? He nails it to his cross as proof that he has paid the debt. So if you know for sure that you are in him, I want you to bow your heads right now. And just thank the Lord for your salvation. Thank Him right now for saving you from all your sins. And then I also want you to pray for maybe someone who doesn't know Christ as their Lord and Savior. And if, with everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed, just to block out any distraction. If you don't know Christ, today's the day. It's not, no reason to put it off. Right now, I want you to pray a prayer. And the prayer is not going to save you, but just the words from your heart. Lord Jesus, I trust you as my Lord. I make you the king of my life. I thank you for saving me from all my sins and taking the penalty on the cross in my place. I trust you as my Savior, and I thank you for saving me right here, right now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me ask you, if you, if you made that decision today, I want to know about it. This is my cell phone. You can call me, or you can text me and let me know, or maybe you're not there yet. Maybe you have questions about salvation. In just a few moments, we're going to do question and answer time. If there's something I said that you have a question about, feel free to text it to me right now. Or if you're watching from the live stream and you want me to call you, I'll call you. We've been doing live calls. And so we'll do that in just a second. So let me make a few quick announcements before we do question and answer time, all right? First of all, uh, I want to thank this church for your generous giving. You, you realize in this weirdest year, the giving of God's people or other churches is actually up the best year we've ever had. So thank you all for that. Because you've done that, 
we've been able to help several families in our congregation, outside our congregation, several thousand dollars have gone to help people who have lost their jobs because of COVID. We've helped with groceries and other things like that. So thank you all very much for your generosity for doing that. Also, you have plans for lunch? Everybody is invited, if you'd like to come, to the Avalos house right over here, okay? And Amanda's a really good cook. Charles tries, but Amanda's a really good cook, so they're invited to lunch over there. There's the address right there, 3411 Appleton. It's just like four and a half miles from here. So um, you're welcome to join us at noon and hang out over there. So we, this is our first Sunday in person with the services and the wristbands. Again, we have better wristbands coming, Amazon hopefully. Um, but we want to continue to caution you that if you're sick, please stay home. We want you to continue to wash your hands. Hopefully everybody's sanitized on the way in. Um, masks are encouraged, but they're not required according to the governor's guidelines, which we're embracing here. Uh, continue to wear your bracelet. You can keep these if you want. Um, there'll be, these will be the wristbands that will be here next week, though. Uh, but most of all, if you, somebody has a red wristband, continue to maintain physical distance, but respect and love one another enough that no matter what color they have on the wristband, that you will um, that you'll respect that. So we'll probably have two more Sundays, maybe even one more Sunday in here before we move out to the gym. We're just waiting on the floor covering. It looks like we need it pretty soon, evidently. So, um, but uh, thanks for all, thank you to everybody who's helped to make all this work possible. If this is your first time, we have a t-shirt for you. We want to give you a Colossians t-shirt over here. A man and Charles will hook you up with that. All you have to do is fill out a connect card Write down your name and phone number. Give us your social security number. Your driver. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Um, do that now. If you if it's not your first time, but you want to get one, they're only ten dollars. We've did, we've priced them in a way that where um, if everybody if we sell half for ten dollars, it pays for the other half that we're giving away. So also we have brand new Revolution Church business cards. Um, Mark has those at the door. He wants you to take two or three on your way out so you can give them back. Give them out. Because on the back side, it's mostly blank, so you can write to somebody, hey, be my guest next Sunday, or write some, hey, I'm praying for you, or whatever you want to write on the back side. So get a few of those as you walk out. Next Sunday, we're going to do communion, okay? And we're going to do that with COVID uh, precautions in place. Someone will actually serve you with gloves instead of you serving yourself or passing a plate. All right, so let's do question and answer time. I'll put on my readers here, and we'll see uh, what we have. <clears throat> All right, um, so uh, someone asked, social justice is a phrase that is used a lot these days, but it has different meanings to different people. What does social justice mean to us? Great, great question. Again, it, it, we are using the same words, but different dictionaries, if you will. Um, Greg DeMent back here on the right, the first sermon he heard before he came to Revolution Church, I preached on social justice. So that was when we were in the book of Micah, and... Uh, who has a, a Micah t-shirt on? Matt does. Matt, stand up. See, this is the t-shirt we did then. We went through the book of Micah. It says, do justice, love mercy, walk humbly. Okay? Um, and so doing justice, social justice is important to God, but it's not the same as what many politicians say. So I would encourage you to read that. What it means is, uh, in James it says, true religion and undefiled is this, to help the widows and orphans. So basically, those who are the neediest in society, you voluntarily help them. It's not endorsing socialism. Socialism is where the government takes it away from you and gives it to the poor, whether you want to or not. Christ calls you to voluntarily give away your wealth, to voluntarily give to the poor. That's where social justice would begin. Um, here's another question. Um, in fact, I'm going to call this one, okay? Jimmy wants me to call him here. So... Let's try to hold it close here. Come on, Jimmy, answer. <laughs> Jimmy Moya. All right. He's not. He's not available. So I'll ask the question. He was supposed to call. All right, here. He said, so you said if you are struggling with sin and reading the Bible about that certain sin, you will find the answer and find joy again. Yes. It, so... Think about this. Uh, recently, we had a big scare. My, my dog, we were cleaning out Bounce Down because we shut it down, we're out of business, and we took our dog with us. Well, a refrigerator got moved, and we didn't know, but there was rat poison behind the refrigerator, and guess what my dog ate? Yes, rat poison. I called the vet, and they're like, get here as soon as possible. 
So I'm driving as fast, I'm driving about 15 miles ahead of the Guardian Angels up 35, heading to Westside Vet, great people. And, um, and, and I'm thinking, oh Lord, please don't take our dog. We've had enough people die, let's not take our dog. And so we get there and they give her the dog equivalent to Epicac and she throws it all up and she's fine. But because there's a, a, a possibility of destroying her kidneys, she had to take vitamin K every day, twice a day. And vitamin K is what restores her kidneys. If I gave her vitamin E, it might make her, her fur and her nails great, but it's not going to help her kidneys. You see, whatever you're dealing with, there is a spiritual vitamin, if you will, in Scripture. Okay? There is a biblical principle there that you need to find. Okay? And you know what's really great? If you ever, when you check in the hotel and you find in the drawer of the Gideon's Bibles, and right in the front it says what to read when, what to read when you're sad, what to read when you're angry. Man, those are great. You may have that. If not, you can Google it, what to read when, in the Bible. And that will help you with that. All right, cool. Great question. Um, here's another question. If you see how the world is going down, is it against the commandment, be fruitful and multiply? Also, if you can't have kids, is there a way to still follow that commandment? And is it wrong to not want kids? Great question. My family and I were just discussing this recently. When you see the way the world's going, would you want to bring kids into it? And you're like, I don't know. And I could fully respect someone who says no, okay? But the commandment is given twice in the Bible. It's given to Adam and Eve who are on an empty planet. So be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. Then it's given again to Noah and his family because, again, the world's empty because it got wiped out in the flood. That specific command to repopulate the earth isn't given to us. But what is given to us is in Malachi it says the purpose of having children is to raise up a godly seed. You see, follow this. If you study anthropology, everywhere around the world where Christianity is dying, people are having less, Christians are having less and less kids. It's where kids are a pain. It's like, oh man, I don't want to have any more. It used to be that Christians had the most kids because they wanted to fill the world with godly people. But what you see is people who are not Christians having lots of kids and people who are Christians having less and less kids. So you do the, do the math for yourself, okay? Now, but here's, here's a suggested solution. Let's say you don't want to bring a child into this world because of the way it's going. I fully agree with that. Here's what you do. You go adopt two or three kids. And you raise them to be godly. And you fulfilled both. You didn't overpopulate the world. You didn't bring in a kid to suffer. And you take kids who probably would have been in sex trafficking or raised in an ungodly home. And you've adopted them. And praise God, we have a ton of adopted kids in this church here. And that's a great thing for Christians to do. It's been said that, if everybody who claims to be a Christian on planet Earth would adopt one child, there would be no more orphanages. They would close down completely. So, great question. Um, uh, let's see. Besides David, what's another biblical example of sinning as a result of losing joy? That's a great question. Um, let me think about that. Well, the first one to come to mind... I mean, I would say it's true for all of them, but as far as, I would say Peter. You know, Peter was so schizophrenic, up and down, up and down. One day he said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Next day he's saying, you know, uh, no, Jesus, don't, don't die on the cross, you know. And he's up and down. I think when he was humble and submissive to the Lord and found his joy in the Lord, he didn't always put his foot in his mouth as much. But that's a great question. Um, I'd have to think about that more. Good job, Charles, there. You stumped me, I think. And he says, please remind the church to come and have unity in Christ at the Oblos for lunch today. Good job. All right. Uh, here's a picture of Carter Holton, who's at home. Carter's ready for the church to launch. He has been excited all weekend. All right, great. All right, good. That's all the question answers for today. Um, go to the next slide for me. Um, so in just a moment, I'm going to dismiss you by sections, okay, so we don't have a, a herd going out the door. But what I would like to do is stand and we're just going to read this blessing over one another and just pray this verse of Scripture as, as our closing prayer. Would you read it out loud with me, okay? Romans 15, verse 5. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another and accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.